to the nation and vaccines are inextricably linked, are they? And vaccine supplies are available in various parts of the world, but it's clear that distribu distribution is not symmetrical. That assessment from uh, Kimanthri Mudli at the Center for Medical Ethics and Law at Stellenbosch University, who says vaccine nationalism, we've heard that phrase before, stockpiling and profit-driven strategies of global pharmaceutical manufacturers have shown up global health inequities. Uh, she's on the line now to Thursday lunchtime. Kamanthi, good afternoon to you and welcome. I want to pick up on that word symmetrical, if I can. Was there any way that it could have been symmetrical? Was vaccine nationalism, was stockpiling not always inevitable? Good afternoon, Jeremy, and thank you for having me. Uh, we have global governance health organizations in the world, and the issue of our vaccine distribution, you know, has been on the cards for a long time. Uh, we would have hoped that there was a more equitable way of distributing vaccines throughout the world. Uh, what we are sitting with now is not just an asymmetry, but a gross asymmetry between countries who have been able to access the vaccine and those who have not. How would you define equitable in this respect, then? Well, I think what we can agree on, and there is consensus throughout the world in terms of who ought to get access to COVID vaccines first, namely uh, healthcare workers throughout the world, that could have been done in an equitable way uh, at a global level, given that healthcare workers are risking their lives to treat and save people with COVID-19. You raised two issues. One is we have not leveraged our participation, South Africa's participation, in clinical trials. The second issue you raise is we've been unable to secure a fair pricing agreement for the first batch of, uh, of vaccines. Let's go to the pricing first. We've learned a very hard lesson there, haven't we? Absolutely. I mean, for a country like South Africa to pay double the price that European countries paid is completely unacceptable. I do understand that uh, European countries invested in, in the research and development of the AstraZeneca vaccine at an early stage. But if you think about our clinical trials, so did we. We had almost 2,070 participants in the South African AstraZeneca trial who risked their health, their lives, and gave a great amount of time to take part in a study on an experimental vaccine. That needs to be taken into account. Why do you think we were unable to leverage that participation? What drove that reticence, do you think? Well, I think it's a belief uh, among some researchers that they have only scientific obligations with respect to clinical trials. However, international research ethics guidance uh, says otherwise, and uh, our understanding in the research ethics community, certainly, is that researchers carry both uh, scientific obligations as well as ethical obligations. And ethical obligations include uh, negotiations around post-trial access and benefit sharing for participants. We, may, we have argued in, in the article that this obligation is actually higher in the context of a pandemic such as the current one. The article that you're referring to is on the Conversation website. I want to ask you one final quick question. Given the problems that you've outlined, clinical trials, cost, etc., um, have we left it too late now? Is it, is it too late to catch up? I don't think so. We, we are still conducting clinical trials. There are several different vaccines that are under trial at the moment. Um, and I think it, there, there is time for, for us to think more clearly about negotiating before we actually uh, uh, continue with these trials. And I'm going to thank you for joining us. Uh, Kamanthri Mudli at the Center for Medical Ethics and Law at Stellenbosch University. This is Thursday lunchtime.